Hello learners, today we will focus on your block 5 unit 17, India's biodiversity, landscape, environment and ecology. Indian physical geography comprises of a land, large landmass formed during different geographical periods which was influenced by various climatical changes. Besides the geographical formations, a number of processes such as weathering, erosion and deposition have also created and modified the relief to its present forms. I am sure you must have heard about the physiological divisions of India. For a quick review, let me tell you that we have the major divisions as first the Himalayan mountains. In on these places, you find lots and lots of hill stations, resorts which are very popular among tourists. Then we have the northern plains. In such areas, you will find lots of cities and industrial towns. The peninsular plateau which has a huge diverse ecosystem. The Indian desert comprising of tourism cities such as Jaisalmer and Udaipur, the coastal plains which comprise of the beaches of India and the islands of India. So, at the ecosystem level in India we have various types and varieties. For example, we have deserts, we have rainforest, we have mangroves, coral reefs, wetlands, estuaries and that actually adds to diversification in our whole system and it is more diversified than a Scandinavian country like Norway. Now, before we proceed further, let us understand and analyze the importance of biodiversity as far as Indian landscape is concerned. Now, let me take you to the definition of biodiversity. Biodiversity is the variety of plant and animal life in the world or in a particular habitat. Now, how is it measured? For example, if you have a wildlife zone near your residence or in your state or you have heard about the term biosphere reserve or a wildlife uh, park, how is biodiversity measured? It comprises of two components. The first component is the species richness and the second one is the species evenness. Now, let me explain to you what is species richness. Species richness is a measure of the number of species found in a community. I hope you must have read earlier in your school books also that we have an ecosystem, we have a food web and a food chain. So, species evenness relates to the abundance in a particular area and the second one is evenness. Evenness is related with the richness of species in that particular area. The Indian environmental history is very, very old and even today more than 4000 ethnic communities across the countries have protected and maintained the cultural and ecological heritage of this country. So, local practices, our Indian traditions, our lifestyle and our way of worship have also led to the conservation of ecosystem in this country. Now, let me take you another important aspect of biodiversity which is known as hotspot. Hotspots in Indian biodiversity is a collection of flora and fauna of a place. Biodiversity hotspot is a region which is of a prime location for the existence of rich biodiversity, but because of increased industrialization and pollution, it also faces the threat of destruction. It is a place which needs our immediate and constant attention to survive and thrive in future as well. Now, how do we classify a hotspot? That is very important for us. To be able to call a hotspot, a region has to fulfill at least two criteria. So, there should be two preconditions, two prerequisites for a region to be a hotspot. First, it should comprise of at least 1500 species of vascular plants that is more than 0.5 percent of the world's total population of plants. So, it should have certain uniqueness in terms of its flora and fauna and second it should have lost greater than or equal to 70 percent of its original habitat. So, due to industrialization or uh, expansion of urban centers, if a biodiversity place has lost 70 percent of its original habitat, it is classified as a hotspot. 
India is one of the 17 mega countries in the world there are where we have four biodiversity hotspots. These hotspots are in Indo Burma Himalayan region, Western Ghats near Sri Lanka, Sudaland and biological from biological diversity point of view India is very rich in resources and due to its diversified habitat and climatical conditions it also supports 75 or 7.5 percent of the total animal species of the world. So, you can see that in India we not only have natural diversity, we have diversity of flora and fauna, we have different types of animals in India. So, all this leads to a unique topographical features of India both in its terms of its terrain, terrestrial and aquatic ecosystem which leads to a very much richness in our biodiversity. Now, another notable feature of India is that this biodiversity differs from region to region. For example, there you will find lot of differences between north and south and east and west. So, the government of India had done a lot of planning and survey and then after that they have identified 10 biogeographical zones. And in these 10 biogeographical zones you will be excited to know that we have more than 1000 species of fauna and more than 50,000 species of flora that is documented across the country. And then this diversity also has number of terrestrial and aquatic biomes. So, government is doing lots of initiatives, they are taking up lots of measures to conserve the biodiversity of this country. Now, we have understood in this lesson that we are a very rich country in terms of flora and fauna. We have number of divisions in our country and in each division we have a specific set of biodiversity. The government of India has initiated number of laws and acts to help people conserve biodiversity. So, let me now discuss and uh, share with you some of the important laws which are very uh, relevant as a tourist professional. The first one is central government has enacted the wildlife protection act 1972. The purpose of this act is to identify protected areas for the protection of wildlife and it has certain punishments associated with haunting. The second most important initiative that government has taken is the wetland conservation and management rules 2010 for the protection of wetlands in different states. The government has also come up with a scheme and a national plan for the conservation of aquatic ecosystem which provides assistance to states for the management of wetlands and various sites in the country. Now, you must have read in newspapers or you must have watched on television that people are still involved in various hunting activities. So, to stop these practices a wildlife crime control bureau has been established to control the illegal trade in wildlife including the endangered species. Various initiatives of government are also related with agroforestry policy. Uh, the policy of 2014 promotes free plantation in, comp uh, in complementary with crops and livestock to expand the vegetation cover. So, these are some of the initiatives and uh, you are aware that in urban areas or in growing towns the problem of pollution is increasing every day. So, in 2010 the government established the national green tribunal through an act. This uh, tribunal works at the national level through state governments to protect the environment, conserve the forest and the natural resources. Now, as a tourism student, I am sure you have you must have visited a wildlife sanctuary. Government of India has initiated uh, the project tiger long back in 1972, which contributed to the conservation of tigers and the entire system. This project is sponsored by Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change. And today we in 17 regions of India, we have various tiger reserves. Cobbett National Park, Ranthambore National Park are part of this project which conduct regular assessments about the number of tigers, their habitat, hunting habits. There is a tiger task force and a, uh, that has been identified and they work for the recovery of the habitat and to increase the population of tigers in reserve areas. 
And I am happy to share with you that the government under the recovery of endangered species has come up with a project integrated development of wildlife habitat and in this um, various places in India are identified and accordingly the species are also identified for example, Hangul and snow leopard in Jammu and Kashmir and in parts of Himachal Pradesh, Uttarakhand and Arunachal Pradesh, Vulture in Punjab and Haryana in Gujarat. Swiftlift in Andaman and Nicobar Islands, Nilgiri Tahir in Tamil Nadu. So, there are different initiatives that government has taken and they are spending crores and crores of rupees for the conservation and management of wildlife. So, there is a lots and lots of initiatives and along with the government policies we have NGOs, we have voluntary organizations, we have local stakeholders who are all working towards the conservation of biodiversity. So, now in the first part of this uh, presentation, we have understood that we have very rich biodiversity zones in India. We have also identified the important types of biodiversity in this country and also the government measures. Now, let me link biodiversity with tourism. You all know that many natural areas have rich biodiversity such as beaches, coast, islands, mountains, rivers and lake and they are all tourism destination. So, approximately half of the leisure trip is taken globally to these natural areas. And you know as a tourist, we are involved in a lot of recreational activity in these zones and today around the globe 40 percent of the economy is based on biological products and processes. So, tourists enjoying trekking, going to mountains, nature walks, jungle safari. So, all these are the activities which are related with biodiversity. So, it is very important for us as a tourism professional to sustain the biodiversity and maintain it. So, as a result of it, I am sure you must have heard about the word uh, UNW2. It is an organization which promotes sustainable, responsible and universal. So, biological resources are valuable assets to sustain the tourism sector and um, United Nations uh, World Tourism Organization UNWTO has promoted sustainable, responsible and universally accessible tourism at the global level. Now, let me share with you what is the definition of sustainable tourism. You must have heard this word number of times. Sustainable tourism harmonizes and sets a perfect balance between environmental, economic and socio-cultural aspects. For example, if you are visiting a forest which is very dense, I am sure you must have read about the various tribes of India who are living in these forests for number of generations. So, when we are conducting a escorted tour in this region, we involve the local people because they are the ones which help us to have an idea about the important diversified regions. So, sustainability helps not only in the conservation of the environment, it provides employment for local promo uh, communities and promotes a strong linkages. UNW is working across the globe. So, you can imagine that throughout the world there may be so many places which are very rich in biodiversity and along with that. Uh, the concept of World Heritage Site is being promoted by United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization. UNESCO has landmarked an area which has a specific cultural, historical, scientific or any other form of significance and is legally protected by international agreements. So, it is happy to share view with you that in India, there are sites which are demarcated by UNESCO as protected zones. These natural sites are selected on the basis of outstanding examples representing significant ongoing ecological and biological processes in the development of terrestrial, freshwater, coastal and marine ecosystem. You will find a lot of communities of plants and animals. and Conservation of such an habitat is important for maintaining the, bio, uh, the biodiversity and also the protection of threatened 
species in this kind of an environment. So, uh, we can say that the uh, um, these various places that are identified in India are very very important from the point of view of conservation. So, let me now share with you the important natural places which are included from the environment point of view in the world heritage sites. The first is Kaziranga National Park or the Kaziranga Wildlife Sanctuary in Assam, second Sundarbans in West Bengal, third Great Himalayan National Park Himachal Pradesh, fourth Manas Wildlife Sanctuary Assam, fifth Kaledio National Park Bharatpur, sixth Nanda Devi and Valley of Flowers Uttarakhand, seventh Western Ghats and eighth Kanchanjunga National Park Sikkim. Now, let me start giving you an idea about uh, the unique special features of these parks and why international organizations, NGOs and environmental lovers are investing their lot of money, energy and resources for the protection of flora and fauna. The first one is the Kaziranga National Park, Assam. It is a home to two thirds of world's one horned rhinos population. This national park is declared as a world heritage site. Uh, it is very vibrant, it is well preserved, it sustains ecology and it is a very very popular tourist destination of northeast. The other than one horned uh, rhino which is uh, abundant in this area, this park also offers pleasant surprises to tourists as they can spot swam, deers, elephants, wild buffaloes, uh, foxes, gibbons, bears, leopards. So, you have large variety of animal kingdom here and it is also the home of Indian tiger and is a tiger reserve. So, whenever you plan to go to northeast do visit this park. Kaziranga National Park has basically three major type of flora which is uh, abundant grasslands, tropical wet evergreen forest and tropical semi evergreen forest. The main characteristics of flora in Kaziranga are the dense and tall elephant grasses intermixed by small swap plants which are left behind by the flood waters of river Brahmaputra. Kaziranga also has uh, 478 species of birds which are both migratory and resident and BirdLife International has identified Kaziranga as an important bird area for conserving its species. So, Assam has a rich diversity and towards the east we have an another important biodiversified region that is Sundarbans in West Bengal. Sundarban is the world largest delta and a mangrove swamp which is formed by merging of three rivers, the Ganges, the Brahmaputra and the Meghnes. It is a world largest estuary century. The area has mangrove forest. Sundarban has again lot of diversity in terms of its flora and it is famous of course for the Royal Bengal Tiger. It is a tiger reserve and a biosphere reserve and it is a home to critically endangered uh, various species of tiger and uh, animals such species such as dolphins, you can spot deers, wild boar, various mammals and of course, the salt water crocodile is another important attraction of this reserve. The tiger population of India is maximum at this location and the best time to visit Sundarban is between November to March. The weather is very pleasant during this time and it creates a perfect condition for tiger sightseeing and other wildlife activities. So, in Sundarbans you will find that the local community and people are very much uh, associated uh, with the various activities related to the conservation and they work as tourist guides, they work as local sub community support system whenever we visit the park. Now, from east let me take you to north where we have the great Himalayan national park in Himachal Pradesh. The Great Himalayan National Park is a huge area and it is uh, one of the national parks which is situated in the Kulu region of Himachal. Uh, the park includes the upper mountain snow melt, we have glaciers of several rivers which are mainly the tributaries of river Indus. 
Now, very important feature of this park is it does not have any road. The location is very remote, it is inaccessible. So, as a result only less than 600 trekkers in a year are able to go inside that park. And these trekkers are the ones which are attracted by the remote forest area, adventure and the serious uh, trekking business. So, it has around 375 flora species and various floral species and very rare species of plants and animals are found. You can spot here snow leopard, Himalayan brown bear, uh, musk deer, horses, alpine. So, you have lots and lots of uh, activities in this. Hot, uh, you have coniferous forests, you have snow peaks in this region, you have glaciers which add beauty to this and uh, the best time to visit is either March, April or May. We should avoid the rainy season or we can visit this park in winters that is during October and November. The government of Himachal Pradesh is taking a lot of initiatives to promote and conserve this park and uh, the Himalayan eco uh, tourism team organizes trekking. Extreme winters such as December and January should be avoided and we should organize this only in the month of uh, uh, sunny months only in the month of summer we can organize various trekking activities. So, the, the park has its own geographical location and is very well conserved by the various government initiatives. The next park that we are going to study is the next park that we are going to study is the Manas Wildlife Sanctuary. This is again a UNESCO World Heritage Site in India and it is located again in the state of Assam. The name originated from the river Manas which is derived from the name of the goddess Mansa. The lush green forested hills and dense population of the surrounding area provide a comfortable environment for endangered species of animals who reside here. This again park is a part of the project tiger reserve, it has an elephant reserve, a biosphere reserve and it is a, a home of endangered species like turtles. This park has the most endangered species in India compared to other parks. So, from Assam, let us now move to our desert state of Rajasthan, Bharatpur Bird Sanctuary. Also known as Kaledio National Park, it is located in the state of Rajasthan. It is a home of around 366 different species of birds. It is known for its winter season and for its migratory birds and it is basically a well managed place which is a uh, very well conserved, various activities such as hunting etcetera are, are banned. It is a punishable offense to disturb the migratory birds. We have floral species, we have fishes, we have snakes, different species of lizards, turtles and variety of other invertebrates. So, this place is again a reminder of rich biological heritage of India and it attracts lots of tourists in Rajasthan. Along with this, uh, let me take you to Uttarakhand. I know you all are aware that Uttarakhand is very, very important biogeographical zone of India and in this we have the Nanda Devi Biosphere Reserve. Nanda Devi is the highest mountain peak of Uttarakhand and uh, is also uh, an important tourist attraction. There are two peaks of the mountain, the eastern peak is known as Nanda Devi and it is important uh, from the uh, Puranas and the Upanishad times and there is a lot of mythological, um, mythological importance attached to it. It is above 6400 meters above the sea level. I am sure if you have read about Uttarakhand, you must have read about Valley of Flowers, which is a national park near Nanda Devi Park. It is uh, not very large, but in terms of biodiversity, it is very important. It is famous for its variety of flowers, which cover the entire region. It is a world heritage site for more than 600 species of flora and 520 species of fauna. Brugyal is a high altitude alpine grassland in Uttarakhand and it is also known for its gardens, green grasses and seasonal flowers. 
the Vogel alpine meadows are snow covered in winter and during the summer we have beautiful flowers and grass. So, Nanda Devi National Park and Biosphere Reserve Valley of Flowers are very fragile ecosystem in India and the government has invested a lot of money and a lot of care is taken in terms of visitor management. There are number of instructions and there are trained guides available within the park that will help you to go ahead with your activities. Now, after discussing uh, these, uh, the last important area of biodiversity region in India is the Western Ghats, which has a Nilgiri Biosphere Reserve and a Bandipur National Park. This is again a hot spot in India and it is spread across various parts of Indian Peninsula. It covers different states of India, it has reserve forest, wildlife sanctuaries in Kerala, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu and uh, Maharashtra. Number of hill stations are there and it is among the top 10 important uh, biodiversified hotspots locations as far as the global world is concerned. And here also we find the rare and critically endangered species of plants and animals. So, I have given you in brief the important aspects of the various sites which are covered by UNESCO as a part of World Heritage Conservation Initiatives. Along with this, we have also Indian deserts and Indian deserts comprises of the cold desert and the hot desert. In hot areas, we have parts of Rajasthan and Gujarat. And lot of tourists visit these places during winters and then we have Ladakh as a very upcoming tourist destination where all the youngsters they prefer to go and enjoy the peace and tranquility of the entire region. We have beaches in India, you find them in Goa, you find them in parts of Gujarat, Maharashtra, parts of Orissa. And we have also islands such as Lakshadweep and Andaman and Nicobar Islands. So, each place has its own unique diversity. The local people play a very important role in its conservation. They help to maintain the ecosystem, keep it friendly for the tourists to visit and also take up various measures based on their religious practices for the conservation of these places. So, we have seen in this lesson that India has a rich flora and fauna. On the one hand, the government is taking up number of initiatives in the form of acts and laws. At the global level, UNWTO and UNESCO are working for the conservation and we have the NGOs, we have the environmental stakeholders which are investing their time and resources for the promotion of biodiversity. As a tourist professional, it is important for all of us that we go for sustainable tourism, we follow those practices and we promote community based ecotourism activities, so that we are able to conserve the environment. We should take into consideration the concept of carrying capacity and also use various biodegradable material during our trip to such places, so that the local habitat is not disturbed. Therefore, let us promote concept of green tourism, ecotourism, farm tourism and involve the local villagers and people around us to conserve this beautiful habitat. Uh, in the end, I would like to share with you the government initiatives by the Ministry of Tourism our government has recently launched a scheme known as Swadesh Darshan scheme. In this scheme, 13 circuits have been identified. These circuits are in the Himalayan region. We have a coastal circuit, we have a desert circuit, wildlife circuit and heritage circuits. We have Rajasthan development uh, scheme related to deserts, Jharkhand eco circuit, Mizoram eco circuit, Madhya Pradesh eco circuit, Kerala eco circuit and an integrated development of ecotourism circuit in Uttarakhand, Jammu and Kashmir Himalayan circuit, Arunachal Pradesh integrated development of new adventure tourism and Madhya Pradesh and Assam wildlife circuit. 
Now, what is the objective? The objective of the scheme is have a, to have a balanced development of the region, to take care of the livelihood needs of the growing population, to conserve our uh, biodiversity and to come up with a comprehensive policy framework along with the legislative and administrative measures for the sustainable use of the various resources. Of course, it is a challenge to implement these schemes. We need to educate our people, aware them with the use of public media and we should also focus a change in the attitude of people towards conservation of natural environment. We should motivate, we should train and empower our local people to take actions and adopt a lifestyle which is environmental friendly. Thank you.